Hello, I'm Alexis Madrigal. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic, uh, previously at Wired Magazine, uh, where I covered a lot of science and technology, as I do uh, for The Atlantic. Um, there's been a big debate in Silicon Valley uh, over the last couple of years about whether all the innovation we've seen is actually worth anything. Uh, and Peter Thiel, uh, co-founder of PayPal and a big venture investor, summed it up just basically in one line. He said, we wanted flying cars, and we got 140 characters, um, obviously referring to Twitter. And what I'd like to argue is that a lot of the changes that are coming to vehicles are actually a lot more important than flying cars. And the reason is that flying cars were actually this idea, kind of a chimera. It was a you know, plane plus cars, and it only made sense because we had these incredible suburban commute times, and we thought that Basically, suburbs would continue expanding forever, and people would continue working forever in downtown cores. And instead, what we got is edge cities and exurbs and suburban office parks instead. And so what car makers have really been working on are solving the problems of that kind of city, not the ones that we imagined in the mid-century. And yet, what they've been working on, I think, is really no less revolutionary or exciting. Like For the last 100 years, roughly, cars have been about the same as they were back then. Obviously, there's been improvements in safety and all kinds of things, but the fundamentals have been the same. The engines, the way that they work, the way that they're controlled. Um, and what we're going to see, I think, in the next 10 years is bigger change than we saw in the last 100. Um, I want to introduce my panelists before we get into the structure of the section where we'll kind of break down where this change is coming. Um, First, on my left, we have uh, Danny Kim, who's the founder of Lit Motors. Um, there's going to be a demo after the session of his two-wheeled vehicle, which is sort of gyroscope-powered, uh, a little bit, I think, probably like the Segway, although I don't want to associate you with the Segway. Um, it's a single passenger kind of pod. It almost You could think of it as a, a motorcycle with walls all, all around you, right? Um, and I think if you need another reason to listen to Danny Kim, USA Today early this month said he may well become the Steve Jobs of personal transportation. Um, yeah, right? That's good. Um, I think that's good. I think that's good, actually. Um, right next to me, we have Jim Pies. He's the manager of North American business strategy for Toyota. And he's working on a bunch of projects that are right up the alley of this session, including electrification, uh, hydrogen infrastructure, car sharing, autonomous vehicles, and other technologies. Um, so I wanted to break, bring some structure to this session because the future of the vehicle is kind of big and uh, amorphous. So we're going to kind of go at this in four themes. Um, the first is sort of alternative drivetrains, what I'm calling the sort of the electric vehicle, although we're also going to talk a little bit about hydrogen. Um, obviously, big changes have, uh, are on the way and have already come in that space. Second is going to be the connected vehicle, which is sort of what happens when your car can talk to your phone, the internet, and other cars. Um, the third is the autonomous vehicle. I mean, this is cars that drive themselves. It's sort of obviously interesting, but there's all kinds of um, complications, both legal and technological. And finally, we're going to go beyond the vehicle. Uh, where we're going to talk about things, you know, should we have the kind of ownership models that we have now? Should we be focusing on road infrastructure versus other types of investments and kind of push to this sort of stranger outer edges of what mobility could actually look like? So let's start um, with electrification. I did a lot of research, actually, for a, a book that I wrote about the first era of electric cars, kind of late 19th century, early 20th century, where it was kind of a, a bench sitting on top of a bunch of lead-acid batteries. Um, but they were quite popular, actually, right around 1900, and eventually got sort of outcompeted by uh, internal combustion engines. And it's really only in the last five or ten years um, that we've seen electric cars um, make a big comeback, uh, you know, kind of bracketing out a few years in the 1970s after the OPEC oil embargo. Um, so what I'd like, um, Jim, if you could just sort of catch us up. What, are, what kind of changes have come to electric vehicles and all kinds of alternative drivetrains in the last five years, kind of new technologies? Mm, sure. Well, uh, Toyota started out, I think, in the modern era of, uh, of uh, electric vehicles more than 10 years ago, producing uh, what was uh, a local car, very small coal in Ecom. Uh, Ecom was would go notoriously a, a very short distance, and that has that actually has been a, 
a big problem for most people is finding the right distance that a, that a full battery charge can, can take. We have, uh, we have progressed significantly over, over the years. Uh, Toyota as a manufacturer of uh, vehicles also, little people, people really don't know this, but uh, is also one of the largest manufacturers of batteries. You know, we have, uh, we have hybrid vehicles that require these batteries and we've been selling them. We have partnerships with Panasonic and we've been making millions of batteries and dedicating uh, significant amounts of, uh, of research budget in, in the field of batteries. You know, so you know, the, the, tr the trick and future of electric vehicles, I think, is so cl closely tightened to, to uh, the battery development. Uh, so in recent, in recent years, we'll, you know, our most recent venture has been a partnership with Tesla Motors. Uh, we, have, uh, we have actually here today on display um, the, a Tesla Toyota vehicle. It's a RAV4 body where we use a Tesla drivetrain. Um, we also have uh, a very small city car uh, uh, in our IQ body that we, that we have uh, developed. But I, as we move along with battery technology, I think that what we're seeing is, is that if, if we don't reach uh, what is commonly, uh, what the mass market will commonly refer to as a, as a, a minimum, uh, then I think minimum that- Minimum range. Minimum range, then I think that what we're gonna experience is a limited use of, of uh, EV uh, vehicles. Now, on the other side of that coin, you know, we, uh, we have hydrogen. Now, hydrogen comes, and, and the experience of hydrogen is much closer to that of a typical uh, internal combustion engine, a gasoline vehicle that you probably all drive every day. It fills up in about five minutes. It has about a 300 mile range. Uh, it's been known to go further than that 300 mile range. Uh, and uh, the, the best part of it is that it, the only exhaust it emits is water vapor. So we see at Toyota kind of a, a portfolio of uh, drivetrains and alternative fuels coming. Certainly battery electric vehicles are part of the future, but you know they depend on, on more advancements of batteries coming in the future. And we also have hydrogen and there'll be other sources of uh, fuel too. Is it tough to support a portfolio of these technologies when both electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles would require both the different and quite costly infrastructure? That's a, that's a significant problem in the, you know, in the, in the market. You know, right now we think that hydrogen infrastructure probably has a higher capital cost in the beginning, but a much lower operational cost as, as we roll out. Hydrogen infrastructure is one, uh, one to many. Uh, what I mean by that is just like a normal gas station, you know, you, you can, once you establish that, that, uh, that hydrogen station, it takes five minutes to fill up and then many, many people can uh, use it after that. On the other side of this, uh, electric, you know, level one, level two, level three, uh, uh, stations for, for uh, recharging, they're a little bit less costly to install on one but because the battery advances have not been there, you know, they have to sit there at these stations longer to recharge. So they both have their ups and downs. Yeah. Edison, I think, in like maybe 1910, highlighted the better battery uh, bugaboo, he called it, which was what he thought the problem with electric vehicles was back then. Um, Dave, why don't you uh, describe how your vehicle works and sort of when the technologies that go into it really became available and how you sort of have put them together? Yeah, um, so uh, gyro-stabilized uh, vehicles um, or gyro-stabilization has been around for quite a while, since like early 1900. Um, and uh, really, it hasn't, uh, it wasn't until the dawn of uh, digital control or, or um, mechatronics that become more um, reliable that our technologies have been available. And I think that's why most of our patents have been able to go through um, with PCT. Um, but uh, I, maybe some of you are familiar with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the digital controls uh, on that in the early 1990s 
uh, basically harken the dawn of uh, digital controls or electronic controls with microprocessors. So it's a lot with what our iPhones are kind of uh, run on. So uh, we are able to take integrate that with um, uh, a CMG or a controlled moment gyroscope, which is in most satellites for uh, positioning, and uh, make that available um, uh, to the to the public. So that's what we're working on is actually bringing that down um, to a cost level that's affordable. So what does this actually mean for a person? Like if I get on to the vehicle and I just sort of lean to the right, it's going to sort of tilt me back. Yeah. So I mean the jar. So our vehicle is you know excuse me. Let me let me get to that too. Um, it's a fully enclosed uh, inline two wheeled vehicle. Uh, so, so you it sit. Looks like a pod kind of. Yeah, sure, a pod. Like, um, yeah, we, we, we don't have a name for it yet, uh, but I guess a pod shape, something out of Jetsons. Um, it definitely <laughs> defies uh, gravity. Uh, maybe doesn't have the same sound effects um, for an exhaust. But, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, you sit in it like a car. Um, it drives. Uh, your controls are all like a car. Um, so but it's a wheel, not. Yeah, it's a steering wheel. You tilts and leans uh, like a motorcycle, though. Um, but you have the same stability and driving dynamics as a car. So let's just say if you uh, came into an intersection and you happened to get into a, an accident, uh, it would stay upright. Um, or if you came upon a patch of snow uh, driving up to Tahoe or uh, driving around the streets here, you would drift in this motorcycle or two-wheeler um, rather than fall over. So it takes really all the complexity and um, the danger out of riding a two-wheeler. Um, and makes it accessible. So, you know, for example, I, one of my tests would either, either to take my mother, own mother, or get maybe Robin Chase to drive it around, um, and that would kind of be my metric of safety. And so it's smaller and lighter, obviously. Um, does it help solve some of the battery problems because you don't need as big a pack, or yeah. it's because it's so small, you actually can't get a big enough pack in? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're, we have a 200-mile, uh, 150 to 200-mile range off of one charge. And that charge uh, comes off from an eight kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, so we actually do solve for um, charging stations. You don't necessarily need a charging station in order to, um, you can drive back to work maybe three or four times and then charge it you know, once every two, once or twice a week. Um, a funny thing about charging stations is, um, you know, I think something that you, you guys were mentioning was, um, uh, you know, range anxiety. And uh, it's kind of an interesting, I think what, what Tesla has been really smart about, and I know you guys have partnered with them, um, and also better places. Uh, historically, charging stations or gas stations uh, basically was, are what dictated um, uh, the fuel uh, that was used or the energy that was used for cars, basically that we know today. Uh, so the FHA after the World War II, uh, when, was that, when that was born, um, or uh, implemented by the government. They created a lot of, sub they invented the suburb, and the suburb uh, invented the highway. And in order to uh, get cars to travel back and forth between the city or work, um, you had to invent the gas station. And you'd tax the gas station, that'd pay for more highways, would pay for more suburbs, and so on and so on is what we have in America today. So it's a very, very smart um, way to kind of approach um, energy. Um, and transportation, but uh, you know, technically, we don't really necessarily need that. So, do you imagine people will be driving your vehicles in suburban areas, or is this an urban transport vehicle? I mean, it would be both, uh, urban and suburban. Um, obviously, there are a lot of benefits with having a, a narrow vehicle. Uh, so, parking is incredibly easy um, in San Francisco. It's you know where we're based um, in New York, um, but you can also lane split. Uh, you can get to work on the highway about 40 to 50 percent uh, faster. Uh, because you can use the HOV lane, you can lane split, uh, you can basically just completely negate uh, traffic. By uh, lane split, do you mean like where motorcyclists go through, like in between? The absolutely, that's that's yeah. That's it a, sounds... That's a, okay. cal that's a California thing. That's a good euphemism for, for that. <laughs> it's, yeah. pretty, it's pretty convenient. I have a motorcycle, <laughs> and uh, for me to get from San Francisco to uh, like Menlo Park, uh, usually in a car would take me about 45 minutes. I can do it on my Ducati in about um, 20. So how, how important is it? <laughs> and how many tickets? <laughs> yeah. Zero tickets. Uh. Um, how important do you think um, that it's an electric vehicle? Like, what, is, is, it, is the electrification of this vehicle meaningful uh, for some reason? Or? Uh, for our vehicle, electric, electrification is it's very convenient. Um, we're not really married to any battery chemistry. We're not married to any uh, uh, form of, of, uh, of energy. 
um, but really our value, um, what we bring uh, to, to increase the value of um, vehicles is safety. Um, so we're creating a safe two-wheeler, or you know, you could you know, dare to say a safe motorcycle, but um, it's accessible <laughs> as well. And we're taking the romance and the efficiency of a two-wheeler and we're integrating that with the safety and the comfort of a car. So there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of benefits that can come out of that, not just here in the United States, but also internationally like China, India, you know, Europe, Brazil. Um, either of you can take this, so I'm guessing it probably goes to Jim. And I think the knock on electric cars has been, because they're subsidized by the government and they're also still expensive, that essentially it's just like a handout for the people who need it least. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, how do you, how do you respond to, to that argument? Well, I think that, that there is a level of person that's buying the, you know, the RAV4, the, the LEAF, uh, you know, that are very, very interested in, uh, in the environment, sustainability. Um, and I think that there, are, there certainly is a, a number of people that are interested in it for driving in the carpool lane in, in California. Uh, that has proved to be one of our one of the bigger motivating factors uh, in the sale of our plug-in uh, 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 Prius vehicle. Uh, but I think that as we, you know, as we as we move along, um, we do have to work toward moving toward mass market adoption of, of electric vehicles. And I think mass market adoption comes when you can have a user experience very similar to a gas, a gas vehicle. It's hard to ask everybody to have, a, you know, to change so radically, you know, their experience uh, yeah. in driving. And, it, and it's, it, it just doesn't work uh, from our perspective. So and what that means is, you know, in, in, our, in our book, a gas car can fill up in five minutes, go about 300 miles, you know, and, you know, and have reasonable performance. You know, when, when batteries can, can achieve something like that, I mean, Daniel's, Daniel's uh, vehicle, you know, 200 miles, that's, that's starting to get in the ballpark, you know. And, and certainly there are certain vehicles that can do that right now, a Tesla X, you know, with the highest battery pack, it can go significantly farther. But Leaf and Volt and, and even our own, uh, our own um, Toyota plug-in vehicle, you know, they have a very limited number of miles on all, on all uh, all battery. Until that really improves dramatically, I think we're, you know, we're, you know, we we got to get to that hurdle. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like price point um, is incredibly important for mass adoption of electric vehicles. And um, uh, typically, a, a battery um, in any car uh, will cost about half um, the cost of a car. Um, you know, if you look at gas, um, uh, it's you know maybe like one twentieth or one fortieth the cost. I mean, like. Uh, it's a very simple uh, calculation. It's one gallon of gas, um, you know, seven pounds. Uh, it's, you, know, you can equate that to about millions of years of compressed sunlight. Um, you know, that's 32 kilowatt hours. That's about the size of the Nissan Leaf, um, the battery pack. You know, for uh, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to compare to that because you know the the actual like storage or the actual gas tank and the pump and the primary secondary pump and your fuel filters, 500 bucks in total. Um, but you know, for uh, for one kilowatt hour, maybe at cheapest, I think maybe you guys are probably around like three hundred dollars per kilowatt hour, and um, you know that that won't get you more than like maybe five miles or something like that. So um, you know, it's really hard to compare the two, and so I think you know, it, I took a look at that earlier on, and I just it just made a lot more sense to have a lighter vehicle that requires less. Um, Less of less of uh, battery uh, because just a uh, you know power to weight ratio is just not quite there. So, you know, for us, uh, you know, a price point at our highest we're at somewhere around like twenty four thousand dollars, and if you use all the tax incentives, um, you know, we'll be at like nineteen, and that's kind of our model. Uh, that's like our, our Tesla Roadster uh, price. Um, so it's really important to hit the masses, and um, uh, you know, it, and it's a very simple physics. I don't know if, how many people here know Amory Lovins, uh, local, local celebrity, energy analyst. Um, but he's been talking about wanting to lightweight vehicles for a long time. Um, it's just been difficult to sort of actually make it happen. Um, he's, let's, actually, he's, uh, he's actually on our, one of our technical advisors. Oh, nice. So I, I know Amory pretty well. It's, um, yeah, very, very smart. Yeah. So. 
Um, let's move on to the connected vehicles. Does anyone here actually uh, interact with their car, like check your Facebook account in your car or anything like that? Not yet. We actually had a couple, of, oh yeah, we had a couple of people in another um, audience that had it. Um, this, the, the idea behind the connected vehicle, and you'll hear people in the automotive industry call it exactly the same, the connected car, connected vehicle, is just that you, know, you should be able to um, communicate uh, you should be able to um, check stock prices. You should be able to um, have the kind of connectivity you have in your phone in your car. Um, but I guess I feel like a lot of people, we already know there's a sort of scourge of people using their phones in their cars. And I'm guessing a lot of people in this room think it's a bad idea to um, have connected driving actually occur, no um, matter whether you know, it's on your phone or in the console of the, of the vehicle. So I, I think one of the key questions, and Jim will probably ask you to address this, is you know, around the user interface. Is there a user interface that could be safe? I mean, clearly this is unsafe, right? But is, is it actually that your brain just can't focus on you know, sending a message while also driving? Well, that, that is a real problem. And uh, you know, cognitive uh, disload is, is an amazing problem that we have to deal with. And, and, and a lot of our scientists are working on just that. But, you're asking me about user interface, yeah. and a user interface is an interesting, interesting idea. I mean, with with uh, some of our product right now, we uh, we use voice as a, as a means for uh, for setting navigation or uh, or moving forward with with certain keys on on our on our multimedia platform. Uh, we're beginning the ideas of gestures. Uh, you know, where we will have uh, some vehicles uh, that will show at some of the shows this year that, that show how gesture work. Um, but primarily right now, we find that the, the best solution to driver distraction in, in a connected vehicle uh, is lockout. Uh, you know, we, we find that we have, to, we have to use lockout strategy. Uh, that, just say, when you're driving, you try and do something and it says no. Right, okay. unfortunately. But we think that there, there are many, many ways that we can move forward, move forward uh, with, with connected vehicle. And, uh, and I just want to point out that, that the very inf infancy is, you know, for like Toyota and Tune or Lexus and Form or Ford Sync, that's kind of infotainment. Connected car goes way beyond that, you know. Uh, and, and I hope we can get maybe into some of the discussion of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, uh, some discussions regarding uh, the vehicle itself communicating its health, mm -hmm. uh, and other forms of communication for safety, for instance, that are, that are critical elements of the bigger picture of what connected vehicle looks like uh, coming in the future. Yeah. And, and last point I would say is that connected vehicle uh, in its grander, grander scheme is running a parallel path with autonomous vehicle. Mm -hmm. I do think that there is a point where they'll converge and an, an important convergence uh, that will make uh, the vehicle of the future uh, so much more interesting. Yeah. I just wanted to, you can do a little um, mental experiment yourself like just to kind of see what the challenge that they're facing is. There's an Intel researcher named uh, Genevieve Bell who had me do this. She said, like, get into your car and look at all the different user interface elements that you actually already have there, right? You've got the wheel for obviously steering. You've got foot pedals for doing these sorts of things. You might have like buttons to control the consoles. You've got um, little knobs to control uh, windshield wipers. You've got the thing to turn on the lights. You might now have voice recognition in your car. You might have a touch screen. And so when you talk about doing these things, you're already, in, it's not like a, an iPhone where it's the only thing that you're looking at, right? You're, it's gonna be like element 14 of the user interface. Um, and I think that's what makes this such a difficult challenge because no matter how good you make the user interface, it's gotta fit in with the rest of it um, already. Lexus, one, one last thing uh, that, you know, to, to make your point and come home with it. We have a collaborative safety research center in, in Michigan, and uh, it, it is, uh, you know, uh, it is demonstrated here at the Toyota tent. We have a very interesting demonstration on just this topic. It, we have a driving simulator there that you sit in it and you'll follow a car follow, following uh, on the screen. You'll, you'll try and keep the vehicle in lane, but then it starts to ask you 
to repeat a number. You know, it'll say six. You don't say anything. And then it'll say four. And you have to say the number that was previously mentioned. And your cognitive disload goes, well, it goes left and right, you know, from, from thinking a, a, about staying on the road and, and, and also trying to think about how powerful, uh, you know, distracted memory is. I would encourage all of you to stop by and, and, and you, you'll vividly see the difference. Yeah. Your you reaction should, time just gets slower, basically they give you another task and it's harder, you're, you're slower at breaking, even though this task is like totally easy and simple. Um, sort of. Uh, Danny, uh, <laughs> Uh, you got to design a car from the ground up. So, like, how did you think about? Did you build in sort of connections for uh, to the internet? Did you think about how people would be using other devices within a car? Yeah, I mean, um, my background is actually in design. I went to RISD for industrial design, and um, you know, UX is an incredible part of you know the curriculum there. So. Um, you know, it was kind of an interesting job because I had to become the vehicle architect. Um, uh, I had to do all the engineering for component placement, so systems engineering, and on top of that, we had to integrate that with the exterior design, the interior human factors, and then um, and then eventually the UX. So, I mean, uh, the way we approached um, the vehicle um, is uh, it's, it's a lot more like a robot. Uh, it's kind of a strange thing to think of a car or a vehicle or, you know, like ours as a robot. Um, but uh, that's kind of how we had to look at it. So, um, Why did yeah. you have to look at it that way? Uh, the, well, there are so many sensors. Uh, there's around 32 sensors in total with redundancy. And, um, you know, there's like a lot of weight sensors. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a very, it's not sensitive, but it's a very complex system. Uh, that come, that puts out a very simple output. So it's a very elegant, simple, um, but yet effective um, vehicle. So uh, we had a lot of fun. I mean, you know, working with cardboard, uh, you know, coming with many iterations, very high iterative uh, process. And uh, we wanted something that, that would feel very comfortable. So um, we use the Honda Civic as one of our precedents. Um, actually, also the Toyota Camry uh, for ingress and egress. So it, you felt comfortable. Yeah, if you if you if get a chance to sit in um, one of our vehicles that we have, um, it's actually quite roomy, and uh, you don't feel claustrophobic. Um, you have great visibility. It's a lot like being in the uh, cockpit of a jet fighter um, with, without the helmet, and um, or the <laughs> training, the or the training, or the turbine engines, or you know, or the you know four Gs, or the loss of sight. And, <laughs> But basically um, the same anyway, thing. But basically right. the same thing. If you if you want to cut those out, um, <laughs> it's uh, the, the, almost the same thing. So um, yeah, that was that was really important for us. And uh, being able to um, one one of our one of, in my research, um, you know, women are actually like eighty percent of all the purchasing power um, for large financial decisions in any household, uh, at least in the United States. Uh, so if you, let's just say you get, uh, you know, I think it's pretty easy to sell any guy uh, on anything that has two wheels and, and technology. <laughs> um, but you know, for, I think, I think women, uh, you know, I think they, if, if you, if you, if you can't get the nod uh, from the wife of the, uh, of the household, then you kind of lost the sale. So uh, let's just say like, oh, oh, honey, honey, can we go to the Lit Motors, web, uh, you know, uh, showroom and take a look at this vehicle? And you know she'll say yeah, and you go in, and if she sits into in the vehicle and does not feel comfortable, and can't imagine herself driving it, feeling comfortable, you lost the sale. So, so you want it to feel like a absolutely family car. Absolutely, it, it and it is. It's a commuter. Uh, it doesn't replace the car by any means. The cars can be around forever, uh, for a very long time, autonomous or subautonomous. Um, but what we do is we have a specific commuter. Um, at least in the United States, that you know gets you to work, you know, half, half the time. Uh, it takes about it costs about uh, 90 cents uh, to go 200 miles, um, and on top of that, I use HOV lane. You're still a lot safer. And you know, when have you? When's the last time you thought about? I can't wait to get to my car and drive to work. <laughs> now, for those of you who have a Lamborghini or a Ferrari or maybe a Porsche or even a new, one of the new Teslas. Um, you know, it's, it's a very rare occurrence, right? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, for me, I, I just want to avoid traffic completely, and so, you know, I have to walk to work. But, um, you know, that's really kind of our goal, is to bring back the, 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 
No, to fall back in love with a vehicle. That's something that I, I, uh, you know, I kind of lost a couple years ago, uh, five years ago, and uh, it's been really hard for me to kind of fall back in love with vehicles. And uh, that's something that we kind of aim to uh, to do is like bring back the experience, bring back the thrill and the excitement. It's like, you know, the first your first love out of high school or college. You know, you know, I lost that, and I would like to get that back. Um, you know, I'm kind of a car nerd in a certain way, but. You know, I ride Ducati Panigale, I take it around a track, and I don't mind going 150, 160 miles an hour. It's quite fun. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, that's the kind of excitement that, I, yeah. you know, I want to bring to the masses. Uh, but you don't have to, you know, risk your life for it. It yeah. should be something that's successful and safe. Let me, let me go to the other end of this connected car, uh, just before we move on to autonomous vehicles. Um, and I do want to give you a chance to talk about car-to-car -car communication, because I think it's probably, um, it's almost like the B2B of this world, right? It's difficult to see like, oh, well, how would this impact my life? So how, how would an actual like, person benefit from car-to-car -car communication? Well, it's, it's, it's a very big safety item, I can tell you right now. Uh, you know, we're, uh, Toyota is experimenting with car-to-car uh, -car communications in Japan. We, in fact, we just opened a, a big nine-acre uh, facility, proving grounds in Higashi Fuji, Japan, that simulates just about every single kind of urban environment that you can have, you know, lights, cross streets, one ways. And vehicle to vehicle communication comes in in the areas that you can't see, your blind spots. You know, every one of us here has a place that we travel where you get to a stop sign and you just can't see where the traffic is coming in that. And you can kind of inch out a little bit and ah, nobody's going, I can go. Or worse, somebody's coming and you have to stop hard. This is the, this is the ba basic premise of vehicle to vehicle communications that one, one car moving in one direction would send a signal. And the cars that I've seen on the, on the <sighs> test tracks right now have a clear, you know the little display that's uh, in your in your speedometer, it, or it can be it can be overhead or on the top of the console, it 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 gives you warnings. It tells you that it's sending a signal, and then it tells you when it's receiving a signal. Now, uh, now it there's a pilot in in Ann Arbor, Michigan, right now, where all makes uh, three thousand vehicles are, are in use right now, and they're experiencing with this, and they're gonna they're gonna report out very soon on the value of, the value of this. And maybe one thing, uh, you know, it, 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 that governments are not able to uh, support l widespread infrastructure. We just can't afford it as a government. But on those one streets where there's that blind curve, that is where they could also put uh, infrastructure that, that shows infrastructure to vehicle, where there's a, a car coming or a, it's a dangerous over a, over a hill or so like something a high tech like. version of one of those mirrors that people put you know it, it, exactly yeah. and um, it, you know if you believe in this kind of uh, of thing which we strongly believe in we think it's an important step in autonomous um, there is a th real threat to this right now the um, for ten years more than ten years uh, the government has set aside five point nine gigahertz in, in the spectrum for intelligent transportation, that it would proliferate through the industry, all through the industry. And it's been only very recently that uh, President Obama has said that, you know, maybe that, that uh, bandwidth should go for uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, so we're in, a, we're in a battle right now to make, sh make, sh make sure that we keep that 5.9 gigahertz, you know, uh, and uh, I would encourage you, if you could, Look, look, look up about it and read about it and see if it... Was it ever auctioned or...? No. That part is working? No, no. Um, let's move on to autonomous vehicles. Has anyone here seen a demonstration of any kind of autonomous driving? Maybe like on television? I, I, I can't say that I, I am exactly a believer yet. It sort of takes an incredible amount of trust. Um, and, but I did see, I, I went down to Volkswagen um, uh, Volkswagen Silicon Valley research facility, and this, you know, they had these like um, demos that were set up where like a, they had like a realistic couple coming home with groceries, and they would like <laughs> get out and they'd pick up the groceries and they'd pull out their smartphone and they'd like push a button, and the car would like 
back its way into a space, like totally perfectly, just as they sat there like holding down the button. It's one of those things that is incredibly impressive when you see it happen. And in that particular case, they were using sensors that are already in their production vehicles. So it's not like with Google, where you've got, you know, they can do whatever they want to that car. They can put all kinds of sensors. Um, this is stuff that's just like kind of off the shelf. Um, and I, I, Danny, I guess I want to start with you because I feel like while autonomous vehicles, uh, at least to me, are exciting, they also like wouldn't be very fun to drive. Um, do you think people actually want autonomous vehicles? It seems like it's almost like they're in the opposite idea of your yeah. vehicle. Um, <clears throat> actually, autonomous vehicles are doing almost exactly the same thing that we're trying to do. It's just in a totally different um, channel. Um, so what autonomous vehicles kind of hearken to are actually or ride share or car sharing. Um, and I think that's actually where the best application for autonomous vehicles are. Um, but, you know, ride sharing or zip car, uh, you know, which did pretty well. Um, yeah, they're trying to put more people on the road uh, with less cars, right? Uh, we're trying to put more people on the road in less car. Um, I, you know, Robin Chase, who founded Zipcar, is a good friend of mine. Um, and if you read that USA Today article, she said some very nice things about me, which she's never done until then. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I wrote her emails like, oh, thanks for the, thanks for the, uh, you know, um, for the quote. She's like, you're welcome. And, <laughs> and uh, she's, I mean, she's hilarious. She's, um, she's awesome. So, um, you know, I think autonomous vehicles are great. Uh, I, I really think that uh, in an, a very dense urban environment, uh, autonomous vehicles could serve, um, as like taxis or what like Lyft or like ride or Zimride or um, Sidecar or Uber um, actually serve for, um, but yeah, I, mean, I it definitely takes a lot of the drive or the fun or the thrill out of the soul of, of a vehicle, which is you know to get out you know on the road, burn rubber. I mean that's kind of like what the I mean that's like George Lucas's um, you know um, that was his mo uh, was he just loved cars so much. And uh, that's kind of like the that's kind of like the heart and soul of it um, was moving around, um, and then you know safety is the, I, I would say the paramount. When you move someone around in you know four thousand, three thousand pounds of steel, uh, you know safety is your number one priority. So um, I think that's a really great step in the right direction. Um, but it really just takes the fun out of moving around or transporting yourself. So and I'm also really curious. I mean, people tend to trust human judgment over machine judgment, even when the machine is better. So I wonder if, like, if you can prove that the cars were in fact safer. I still think people might not want to to have them. Um, what do you think, Jim? Yeah. Have you? Yeah, there's an there's an interesting uh, dichotomy here. Uh, so first of all, let me say that uh, our president, Mr. Akio Toyota, you know, is drilling into all of our all of our associates something called Wakaduki, and it's it's basically the idea that. Just exactly what you said. The bring, oh, bring back the spirit and emotion of cars, and the fun of driving. You know, so you know, and we're we're designing cars right now that bring back Wakaduki. You know, to you know, to the to the, the vehicle. But from an autonomous point of view, I mean, maybe I slightly differ from your point of view, Daniel, in this in this regard. Think about where you spend most of your time as drivers. Now, maybe not this audience, but or maybe some, but um, it's in traffic. 805 north for me on, on, in, in LA. And uh, wouldn't it be cool if, it, you know, if you didn't have to be as concerned? Now, you still have to pay attention, but as concerned that your car is going to hit that car in front of him when he comes to a complete stop. So I think that the Toyota approach right now is, is that, yeah, we're studying the level four autonomous vehicle that completely drives itself. But where, where we're going more is maybe the level two. Or, and, you know, what which, would the levels be? Like lay them out for us, what's level one? Well, level one, and this is defined by NHTSA, uh, you know, is, is just a basic automation like ABS, um, automatic uh, brake systems. Um, level two is when you take one of those and combine it with another one and you have a different level of automation in your vehicle. So for instance, if you took a, a steering system uh, override and, and braking system override, and you can kind of combine them into a, a pre-collision system, that's a level two, uh, a level two automated technology. 
Level four is a car that drives itself. And so three, where does, where does like self-parking go? Self-parking is, is kind of a level two. You know, uh, level three is where you actually cede control of the vehicle, uh, you know, for some periods of time. But kind of getting back to where Toyota is on this, we believe a driver should always be in the driver's seat and in, in, in control and that the autonomous features that, that are being developed should be developed as driver-assisted technology. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that we're, we're moving in that direction right now. Just, just a, you know, I think, I think traffic in general, I, I, does anyone here like traffic? <laughs> so everyone here loves traffic. <laughs> um, interesting. Um, it's the wrong crowd. Um, but, um, you know, 70% of most people drive alone uh, on average in the United States, about 80% in California. Um, and uh, I, most people here drive alone. So, you know, about 70% of the capacity of your vehicle is not being utilized. You know, I think that's why we have to move into a smaller vehicle um, because, uh, you know, it's just wasted space completely. Um, and that's actually what causes traffic. If you look at India and China, uh, where, uh, you know, space is at a premium. Space in America is not at a premium by any means. Um, we're, we're incredibly... Um, uh, uh, just incredibly wasteful um, or just not very mindful about how to use space or utilize it. Like I think in New York, it's probably a better precedent for what the rest of the world is experiencing. So, um, you know, I don't really think we deserve all that space because we don't use it well. Um, and that may not, that may not be, uh, that may be actually more of a, of a, of a reason um, uh, because of our geography, right? So Brazil actually has a lot of the same habits that we have in how they utilize space. Um, if anyone's been to Brazil. Um, so I think, you know, for, for us as a, as a, as a country to, to be the precedent uh, for technology and how to implement, uh, uh, you know, urban planning, uh, you know, uh, be the model for urban planning, we have to adopt, a, like, you know, driverless cars or, you know, smaller vehicles um, that are exciting and, you know, fun. I think Toyota's doing um, a smaller vehicle like the iRoad. Uh, which is an incredibly smart, um, you know, another approach to uh, transportation. So I, I think it's up to us to, to lead the world um, and to uh, basically show, like, well, this is what, this is what the next sustainable, uh, you know, uh, philosophy or mindset or policies that are going to be set. And, um, you know, hopefully the government responds to that yeah. uh, because governments really don't, larger, larger companies don't really respond to anything unless there's some kind of uh, regulation. So. I mean, one, uh, it seems like one problem that people have in terms of what they buy, the kind of car they buy, is they buy for sort of the maximum capability that they might ever need. So they buy for, you know, eight seats, even though they might only need eight seats twice a year, but they want it for that two times a year. And it, it's always seemed to me like there is a kind of business model innovation in selling a car that has, you know, one seat, two seats, it's very small, along with like a bundling in a car sharing, you know, subscription so that you... You use this normal car for all the stuff you need, and then when you need a tank, you can go get a tank, you know, and that's totally fine. But it just seems like there's been no push to change, you know, the ownership models or like the way that you could purchase and bundle these things together. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is Toyota working? On, and I know you're working on some car sharing things. Yes, uh, Toyota's got car sharing projects going on um, in Portland and in San Francisco and in Irvine. Uh, we have our electric IQ vehicle in service there. Uh, and just as you mentioned, we, we also have a new project going with Scion for, uh, you, you know, you buy a Scion vehicle and you get credit to uh, kind of work through our dealership network to up, obtain a, a Tundra when you need one or a Sienna when you need one. Uh, so these are new ideas that are, that are coming forward. And we have been carefully studying. I know a lot of OEMs have been kind of jumping into buying up companies and, and focusing on it. We're trying to find the right, the right avenue for this. I mean, car sharing is, is definitely a model for the future. I'm not 100% sure that it will, will, will dominate, um, you know, the, the market, you know, even 10 years from now. It will have a place. Maybe 10%, 15% of the, of the, of the, of the volume will, will be focused on uh, car sharing. I mean, it's, I mean, sorry to interrupt, but I mean, like, I, I really so get your questions ready because you're coming up next. Oh, sorry. Um, and uh, you know, I really feel like car sharing actually is going to have a large role um, because of uh, this next generation of uh, car buyers. 
um, who are not car buyers anymore. They, they'd rather buy an iPad or an iPhone rather than buy a car. I think something that you know I experienced, and going back to art school at 25 was very interesting because uh, it's a whole new generation, um, and I spent five, you know, four to five years with them, and you know they're they're very different. Uh, they're very different from I'm, I'm at the tail end of Gen X, and um, uh, you know they they have different priorities. They're more interested in uh, what's going on on their phone than uh, buying a car. Uh, they're just not interested. I, I think from, a, from if I was the CEO of a larger OEM, I'd be very, very worried. Um, because how do you incentivize these, uh, this next generation of entry level car buyers to buy this 4,000 pound you know, uh, product? Um, so I think- I think I some think of this is also demographic shift, which you can see with younger, uh, Younger people wanting to live in urban cores, where the you know the kind of incentive structure is different. It's harder to have a car. Yeah, it's more about service, and I think for larger OEMs, they you know they want to produce volumes, you know, hundreds of millions, you know, millions of cars. Um, so uh, if that's starting to disappear, then what happens to the jobs? What happens to the revenue? What happens to the production? I mean, are, are OEMs going to be coming a, a software company like what Google's doing? Um, you know, so there has to be, there, for me, in the future of five to ten years from now, I mean, uh, you know, 15 years from now, I mean, that's kind of how you guys think, a little bit larger, like yeah. decades rather than, yeah. you know. I mean, I think that it, 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 it is true uh, that there is a changing demographic, that a, a, a smartphone is, is, replaces in a lot of ways for younger people, you know, the means for contact. Uh, when I got my driver's license, it was the day of my birthday, and I couldn't wait to get so I could visit my friends. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, but let me just point one trend, if I could. You know, on a global basis, you know, maybe in 2007, we reached this 50% population in urban areas. That's a lot, le but, but that's on a global basis. In, in the U.S., it is less. You know, right now, about 30% uh, movement toward, toward, toward the, in with, dense a, with a growth. It, er, dense, er, dense urban cities. Dense, okay. Okay, yeah. Dense, yeah. Dense I would say it's like 50-50, but yeah. Okay, in the dense urban side, side of this. Still a significant number of people that, that, that live in, in rural areas, in suburb areas that have to make movement. You know, and, and, and I think you're right. There is a changing demographic, mm -hmm. but I think the story has to get to unfold as to where the percentage of, of car sharing. I know Toyota will be part of that in the, in, in the future, but... Um, what we still, I think we still need to see how it works out. Let's go, sure, let's start here. Taking up a larger percentage of my vision, so <laughs> you were definitely. Uh, hi. Um, I was just wondering, how are uh, cities going to change? How is the transport in infrastructure going to yeah. change with autonomous vehicles and the range limitation and all that? It's a good question. I, uh, from, from my perspective, uh, cities uh, probably will have an interesting amount of infrastructure that they have to develop for to make autonomous vehicles work. I could at some point see a non-autonomous city and an autonomous city. And, and, and I think it's not about the car itself or about you know, the technology or the infrastructure in the streets. I think it's about big data. Uh, and, and the ability for for cities to uh, uh, to develop an, uh, the IT flexible scalable infrastructure to handle big data. And what, what, let me explain that if I could. You know, congestion, the biggest headache, biggest misery for cities. It it produces noise and pollution and delays and stress and <coughs> parking. Uh, cities like San Francisco are beginning to build the infrastructure where they have sensors actually in the streets that determine where a parking space is available. They're also working through SF, you know, you know, SF parking. They're, they're looking in to determine where uh, public parking garages have uh, available parking spaces. You know, I could see at some point in time, you know, if autonomous was, be was becoming the future that a city might mandate that all the parking needs to be in some way monitored. Um, it could happen like in London, for instance, where every street is covered by a, a, some sort of video camera. If you're, if you're applying facial recognition through, through video cameras in a city, why not determine 
where an empty parking spot is through those cameras. Anyway, there's going to be there's going to be a need, this, and it's not just about parking. It, there's many other a aspects of a, of a connected car. Connected car will will access data, consume it, and then provide it in the future. And uh, and cities have to be ready to accept that information and provide it in real time. And then that's when the joy of living in an urban environment gets back to you because there's less cars, less parking you know, problems, and more ability to ride your bike and walk. And just to speculate a little more wildly and very quickly, uh, I, you know, I think I've seen basically kind of two different scenarios that these autonomous vehicles actually allow the excerpts to continue spreading basically as far as you want because you're watching a DVD you know, on your two and a half hour commute to work, right? So that could be a bad thing. On the other hand, transportation within cities could get a lot better and might, people might in fact want to live in cities even more than they already do. And you see, uh, you see people kind of planning for, for both scenarios, I think. Yeah, and you know, for uh, from what I've experienced is, um, you know, I think autonomous vehicles in a city um, like uh, like environment uh, or context, you know, would kind of eliminate parking uh, because if you have these autonomous vehicles just going around from ride to ride to ride, these vehicles are always in transit. Um, so parking would actually only be reserved for um, someone who actually owned a car and needed to park it. Um, so whether or not you know, I think the mass market would have the opportunity to buy an autonomous vehicle. And I, I feel like that's kind of like up in the air, but I think the, the, the Zipcar rideshare service, you know, through Google partnered with Toyota or, you know, um, I think it's definitely like, you know, very close in the future. Um, it's just, you know, the question of whether or not you'll be able to buy one is another, you know, it might be more of a luxury rather than a, than an actual application of mass you, market. And if you want more speculations, Google whistle cars. There's a guy who's been sort of game planning out some of these things. Oh, yeah, um, cool. We've got one right there. So th thanks a lot for the um, comment on parking. I actually run a company called Streetline that goes and puts out sensors in the ground that detect the presence of a car for parking. So <laughs> beautiful topic and beautiful plug for my talk tomorrow. <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, Danny, I want to pick up on your point on OEMs being or moving towards, in essence, being software companies. Mm -hmm. And, and this is a very interesting topic. I mean, it took a software company like Google to go make the autonomous uh, vehicle discussion mainstream. Yes, some of the auto companies were working on aspects of it, but they really pushed it forward. Uh, if you look at the Model S, uh, the car, I mean, what really got me, the car upgrades itself after you buy it. Yeah. Uh, because it's basically a software platform with a bunch of batteries and four wheels. Right. So so the question to both of you is, is, is are, are the OEMs kind of set up for that next generation of, of competition, whereas as users go in, they're going to expect that kind of experience and the software, and it's not just the body of the car and, and so on. So appreciate your comment. Do you want to go first or? Go ahead. OK, I'll pretend to be one of you guys. Um, <laughs> so I mean, we just got a new factory. It's 100,000 square feet. We're you know, very well on our way. But um, you, know, uh, you know, a core competency of, um, I think, you know, so for example, like BMW, right? Uh, it's like 300,000 employees. Um, you know, most of them are not software based. Um, I would say the majority of them, like 99.99999% of them are not software based. So it's a huge shift in core competency. Um, so uh, I think, I don't know, what, what's, a, what's the employee, how many Coo employees are at Google? Like, like 50, maybe question. like 40,000 or something like that? Hmm. that yeah, it's 10, like 38,000, 38, 38, like almost 40. So, uh, you know, that's, and that's mostly, you know, PhD software, you know, they're just starting to hire hardware. Um, you know, I think if I was a CEO of a large OEM, I would be very worried um, because even my board wouldn't be able to make the right decisions um, into what direction on top of that, and I'd have to be responsible. And then, you know, my VP of sales and like uh, engineering all would have to shift. And uh, but I do see, you know, OEMs uh, acknowledging that um, from the outside. Um, is uh, there's a lot of um, uh, in Silicon Valley now. I think every large OEM has. Um, a research and design center um, in in Menlo Park. So when we're saying OEM, we mean car companies. Car companies, sorry, yeah, large car outside. companies. Yeah, so I heard everyone pick that up. Half a you know billion dollars plus in valuation, something like that. So you know, and, and I've I've I didn't realize that until basically this last uh, spring, where you know they were all con kind of contacting us. So 
Uh, you know, for us, we're, you know, we're a robotics company, technically. Uh, it's just we're more of like a rolling iPhone, a rolling smartphone. Uh, you know, we, can, we use ARM processors, um, you know, uh, which is kind of great because you can, you know, basically code or put like a, you know, develop an app for a vehicle. Um, uh, and that's oh, how we're... Can I cut yeah. you off and go to Jim? Just oh, sure, I please. I want to get yeah. a couple more questions. Um, we're, a, we're a software company uh, in a large degree, you know. I would, uh, we have we have software engineers everywhere. Uh, uh, right now, we have millions of lines of code in a in a in a, in a typical ve in a typical ve vehicle. And then, as you as you move toward things like autonomous, uh, you know, we we're very close with Google. Uh, we've talked with them a lot. You know, there's three fundamental technologies: recognition, which is the sensors, judgment, and operation. The judgment technology is 100% about software. You know, and uh, and 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 it's whether it's whether it's autonomous or whether it's just the plain multimedia system in the center stack, the amount of software integration that that occurs is phenomenal compared to the days when I had a non-fuel injected carbureted car that didn't have a single computer on it, which I have in my garage right now, uh, six nineteen sixty nine Land Cruiser. But, um, let's go. Sure. Okay. Uh, I think, yeah, she'll be there. We'll try. Uh, thank you. I had a question for Danny. Um, I think a lot of people who are intrigued by and fascinated by ideas, it's not just the ones that have succeeded and thrived, but the ones that have failed along the way. Of all the things you've invented and tried to invent, have you had one that had just totally failed where you thought it would succeed? And what did you learn from that process? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I haven't yet. So that's kind of. <laughs> Keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> um, you know, uh, there's. I do a lot of research um, before I take a dollar. Basically, um, I don't sell someone unless I believe it uh, from from an academic level. So I went to read college, dropped out, but I learned a lot uh, through that through that process of academic rigor. Um, and I apply that into business. I apply that into design. Um, I know how to create arguments that are, you know, could be substantiated logically um, to a point that's like frivolous. Um, so that was um, that's really important for me. Um, so there, you know, if you look at business, there are a couple of things that you have to de-risk or reduce the risk on. So once your market liability technology, um, you have to have a very good sense of how to execute. Also build a great team, um, and you know, for, to dream of. Of an idea and have be, have so much passion behind one concept is, in, I would say, about almost like fifty percent of all of those things. And um, you know, I, I was, I've been very lucky to be where I am and to work with friends and um, have an amazing team and uh, just have the opportunity actually to be here. So you know, thank you. But um, uh, yeah, I think that I think you can do it. You just need to find one mentor. Uh, I found Robin Chase and Saul Griffith and John Maida. Um, I was really, and they kind of drop kicked me into a new stratosphere of thinking. Um, you don't have to go to Harvard uh, to get, uh, you know, to get MBA. I would actually say that's almost detrimental in a certain way because you get locked into a way of thinking. Um, you know, we had a case study written by Harvard. You know, I'm an art student who just basically. So um, it's not necessary, but I was interested in teaching the class last spring. So, um, but. Um, you know, there are. Can I cut you off one more time? Oh yeah, just one more question. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Only because we're we literally have one time. Minute left. Oh yeah, it's like yes, one minute. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Palo Alto. Mike and I met today. We both have Teslas. Um, my question is, when I bought mine, I have the big battery pack, performance, and um, I was told that 50, 50 some odd miles, let's say, of the three hundred and fifty charge I'm supposed to get, really should be on reserve because Absolutely. it wears the battery out. So yep. people should be aware of that. Is that the case with yours too? And Mike has a question after this. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I think anyone using uh, batteries, um, you have to be very uh, uh, conscious of the last 20% and also the uh, top 20%. So you should actually really never charge past 80%. Yeah, T try it on your next iPhone. <laughs> never charge past 80% and never drop it below 20% and your iPhone battery life will like you, you'll probably get like 3,000 cycles. Um, like very at a, I'm not gonna get geeky about it, yeah. but Tips it's good for use. you. <laughs> Tips you can use. I'll bring out charts and graphs, but yeah. Mike, you may have uh, five seconds. Quick yeah. one. <laughs> Range anxiety. Yes. 
Uh, I live here, but also in LA. I can't take my Tesla very easily to LA. When will I be able to? Uh, probably not for a while. Uh, I don't really see any battery technologies uh, on the horizon that will proliferate or be able to be. Uh, um, there, I don't see any breakthroughs in, in battery technology that's going to make it to the mass market in the next five years. You got to stay here or just take your private jet. So, you know. <laughs> Let's thank our panelists. Thank you.